We are sitting here in the People's Library, uh, which was refurbished between 2010 and 2014. At the same time as the library was being refurbished, so was the Town Hall extension. And the library was, before the refurbishment, 70% inaccessible to the public and 30% accessible. And afterwards, it's the other way around. And what I think is fantastic when I walk around the library is how many different people you see of all ages kids in nooks and crannies doing their homework, and they have a sense of ownership of the space. And my question to you, Richard, is how much was this really by accident or design? What, what was achieved? And how much does it say about the ethos of what you're trying to achieve with the city, what you've done with these buildings? Uh, well, I, th I think some of it was es essential about maintaining the life of two uh, wonderful uh, buildings. Some of it's essential that... Uh, uh, for the, the two floors that were the stacks, is that once we took the books out, there was nothing holding the floors up. Uh, and that's almost literally true, by the way. Uh, there, there's uh, no weight-bearing capacity whatsoever in those, uh, 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 those floors. Uh, there are other things we needed uh, space for, in particular the archives, which is what's gone into the, uh, the, the ground floor and the basement. And we had, of course, a, a basement theatre uh, the library theatre, which was too small uh, in terms of number of number of seats, it wasn't accessible. Uh, so there are a range of things we needed to uh, uh, deal with. And I think in terms of buildings, whether it's inside or uh, out outside, is uh, I think the first question is always is that uh, uh, if it's an existing building, what what's the problem with it? Uh, what are the problems you're trying to solve? And I think there were problems to solve within the, these buildings and we got very creative solutions to dealing with those. At the same time, of course, um, the uh, most wonderful parts of the, these buildings were also restored in a way that re reflected uh, their history. So the magnificent reading room is still the magnificent reading room, and you can still hear conversations that you're not supposed to hear on the other side of it. Uh, <laughs> that uh, the Shakespeare Hall, the entrance into the, the, the library, is, uh, and it's been made absolutely uh, magnificent. And probably uh, an even finer example is the other side of uh, Library Walk is the Rates Hall, which uh, uh, the Rates Hall had become really, uh, well, almost unrecognisable for what it was. And I think it's been uh, restored in a fantastic way. So we, uh, this, this seems to me uh, almost the epitome of good, uh, good design. The functionality of these buildings has been improved significantly, uh, maintaining the most beautiful features of them and improving all, all, all of the rest. That, that seems to be a job well done. A couple of weeks ago, we were on the top floor of number one, St Peter's Square, and Andy Burnham was pointing to the whole beautiful vista and saying, if you want to know what Sir Richard Lees has achieved for Manchester, look at the transformation of the city. But how can you get the balance between, is, is there a role for the city? In getting the balance between heritage and new build rights? I, well, I, I think we have lots of magnificent buildings and as far as possible, if they remain functional, if they're uh, preservable, then we should do, uh, do so. And I think we've, we've certainly uh, attempted to do that. We, we've also been uh, bold. And whilst from the top floor of KPMG, you look out on uh, the library, uh, you also look out on the, uh, the back of the Town Hall and the Town Hall extension. You also look out on St Peter's Square. Uh, ten years ago, St Peter's Square was a mess. It was a nightmare. There was all, things dotted all over the place. You couldn't have walked, uh, walked across it. Mm. Uh, it had a, uh, a cenotaph that almost had a Metrolink platform coming out, uh, uh, out, out of it. Um, I, I suppose two things. First of all, we, we did have the vision to uh, create a, 
a new square. It was done through competition, so we, we got good people to come and do the detail of the design. But we're also brave enough, arising out of the first consultation, where uh, a lot of uh, uh, certainly ex-servicemen groups said, well, can you move the cenotaph, please? We don't like it uh, where, where it is. Now, it's clearly a potentially sensitive uh, uh, issue, but we desire, uh, decided that we would, with the support of ex-servicemen's groups and the faith groups for whom this was very important, we would move the, uh, move the cenotaph. So uh, I think the only people that objected was the Lutyens Society. I don't know if there's anybody here from the Lutyens <laughs> Society, uh, but I would have to point out that Lutyens didn't want the cenotaph in that position in the first place, <laughs> so uh, it wasn't that much of an act of sacrilege to, uh, uh, to move it. Post-1996 bomb reconstruction, I think for people of a lot of uh, age here, they'll go down to what's now uh, Exchange Square, look at the uh, old Wellington Sinclair's Oyster, Oyster Bar and think, oh, that's lovely. But of course, we move those a couple hundred yards further north from where they'd been pre uh, previously. Uh, that was able to create probably the most single important feature of the reconstruction of the city centre post uh, IRA bomb, mm. which is New Cathedral Street. Uh, one of the fundamental problems we decided we were going to try and solve uh, after the 1996 bomb was that the, these monolithic masses had been built all the way from Deansgate through to High Street and the city centre had be, become almost impenetrable at grade uh, through a huge swathe of the city, city centre. You simply couldn't cross it north-south. Uh, what we wanted to do was to uh, create that ab ability to move through the city centre north-south and to reintroduce, in particular, what was left of medieval uh, Manchester back into the city centre, which had been cut off from. So if you stand at the far end of uh, New Cathedral Street, well, you look in one direction and you see the top of the cathedral sticking out, and you look all the way back and you can see St Anne's Church. That's a view that's probably not existed for 150 years or until we, we did that, but that's a real demonstration of, of a reconnection of the city centre. I think it's one of the, the examples of why the city centre works a lot, lot better. Uh, standing at the end of New Cathedral Street is a real symbol of how we change the city centre then. Yes, it's very interesting because a lot of people will look to point to the IRA bomb. It was four weeks, wasn't it, after you became leader that this mm. happened? And it wasn't the, my fault, though. It wasn't your fault, I know. It was the biggest bomb on the UK mainland, I think, since the Second World yeah, War. It that's was right, a massive yeah. thing uh, to happen. But obviously, you hadn't anticipated this. You had become leader four weeks earlier. You probably had ideas and vision of what you wanted to do. How were those ideas changed? by that happening and how did that set the course for the rest of uh, the next 25 years? Uh, well, it, first of all, it didn't set the course for the next 25 years. I think we were already on, uh, uh, we'd already mm -hmm. set a course. We mm -hmm. set a course under, under my predecessor and it's worth uh, bearing in mind that within uh, Manchester city centre, the only place that the bomb was not heard and felt was inside the Bridgewater Hall because the insulation and the springs it was on meant that people uh, working in it uh, didn't hear it and the, the Bridgewater Hall was uh, finished in, uh, and opened in 1996, later, later that year. And I think that's indication that some of the things about uh, building a modern city centre were, were already on, underway. And um, one of the important things about the uh, IRA bomb, apart from it being horrific, apart from a very large number of people being injured, a lot, large number of people being uh, traumatised, uh, was that we were in a position uh, as a city, we had already created the partnerships and the relationships that we were able to respond to that bomb, probably in a way that no other city could have done at, at, at that time. Um, part of that was I think doing the, the right things immediately, which I only found out the theory about a, a, a lot, lot later is that, uh, and the theory is this, that when you have any sort of disaster of that sort, a bomb, an earthquake, uh, flooding, hurricane, whatever, uh, whoever the equivalent of me is in that place always says we're going to build back better, just as we're <laughs> saying after COVID. Always, yeah. always. Uh, there is a basic economic law that goes with this. If you have a disaster of that sort, uh, you immediately lose capital 
to build back better, you need more capital, yeah. by definition. And yeah. um, well, the first thing we did was that effectively by giving a real priority to get all the businesses that have been displaced, there are over 600 of them, uh, all the ones that were viable, back up and operating, getting people back to work as quickly as possible was part of uh, stopping that, that flight, of, uh, flight of capital. Uh, apart from doing that is that we were already a city that was beginning to uh, see opportunities rather than, uh, rather than problems. And we saw this as an op opportunity, yes, to uh, uh, really to correct some of those planning mistakes as we was, saw them then from the 60s and uh, 70s, to start trying to do uh, some of the fundamentals like reintroducing the city to the river. Like most Victorian cities, we built our back to the river and we saw the opportunity, particularly down in Victoria Street, to uh, pedestrianise that, to uh, start opening our river up to the uh, city. So all, all of that was going on. Sometimes projects can suddenly become hot potatoes, can they? they can become very controversial. If it happens in the private sector, it's easy. You ask Stephen Holland to come in and rescue them. But if you're in, in the public sector, you've got like uh, Piccadilly Gardens, for example, you might have controversies around memorials and so forth. How do you deal with that in a good way? And is the way in which a city uh, consults with its citizens and with residents now changing? Oh, I think over the years uh, we've got a lot, lot better at uh, consultative uh, processes. Uh, uh, I think it's, uh, the language of consultations changed to uh, certainly the importance of lived experience, the uh, notion of co-design, co-production, and, and uh, so on. But although I think, again, in Manchester, that, that goes back quite uh, a long way, although perhaps not strictly, well actually it is in the design area because clearly zero carbon as an aspect of design is pretty fundamental uh, now. When we developed our first uh, climate change strategy for the city back in 2008, Manchester is certain future, uh, where there are a whole range of groupings saying to the city council you ought to do this, that and the, the other, and we turn around and say, well look, if you're not happy with the strategy as it is, join us and write the strategy. Yeah. Um, that's really good. And we had over 200 people and organisations join with us to write that strategy. And I think those are mechanisms we use more and more and more and, and more. So um, uh, recently, when we did the refresh of the Our Manchester strategy, 10-year strategy, uh, that willingness to think long-term, plan long-term, has been a real feature of, of the city. It was the biggest level, even in the middle of COVID, the biggest level of involvement we'd ever had in developing, uh, developing a strategy. If I go back a stage to uh, the first iteration of the Our Manchester strategy back in 2015, we asked people what their dream Manchester was. Mm. Uh, we encouraged people to dream about the sort of city uh, they wanted. And by asking that sort of question, you got far more, I suppose, cr uh, creative, informative, yeah things that came from people than uh, simply, do you want your road there or there? We had conversations uh, four years ago odd, about uh, how we could leverage the power of design to help deliver the city's strategies. We had a conversation with uh, Lou Cordwell about this and you came up with the phrase, design is how, because people often don't really understand what design actually is. I've always thought design is how is quite a good way of, of looking at that, but it doesn't only relate to the the public realm and the physical built environment, it relates to so many other things too now. So how do you think design can help deliver the strategy? Well, yeah, I, I think uh, clearly a lot of people uh, will think about design in terms of uh, graphic design, uh, the architecture of buildings and, 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 and so on. And, and, and they are aspects of, uh, of design, but there are pretty much everything you do needs to be designed in, uh, in some way, does that by uh, accident. And what I think we were talking about within that context is how we design uh, public services. And it's something I've been making the case for for very many years now, particularly the services that are provided for uh, those people with greatest need in uh, our society is that public services tend to be departmentalized, they tend to be siloed, they tend to be one size, uh, fit, fits all. And one of the things we've been working on now for a large number of years with a certain amount of success is how we join that up. 
So going back to Hume in the early, early 90s, uh, when we were debating uh, radii for road junctions, um, the uh, DFT manual, which highways engineers were following at the moment, basically said you have to have a, ra a radii that was gentle enough for an articulated lorry to be able to turn the corner without having to cross the centre line of the road. Uh, we started from a different point of view, which was, uh, what about somebody who wants to cross the road? Yeah. Uh, and if you want to cross the road, you don't want the radii like that. Uh, like that. So let, let's design it from a people point of view. And, and that's, say, about public services, and I say particularly for those people in greatest need, we start to turn it round. And instead of designing on the basis of departmental priorities, on professional skills, although professional skills and training have their role within this, we should start with a person, with their family, with the place that they live, and design the services around them. Eamon Boylan, who can't be with us tonight, sent me a question for you, which was about uh, how you decided not to have cul-de-sacs in Hume, but to have roads that actually went through. And, and that was all about the livability of an area. So uh, where did that thinking come from? And, and, and how did it work out? I think probably the, the single uh, push of that thinking at the time was um, uh, George Mills, a practicing architect in uh, uh, Manchester. There was some evidence that cul-de-sacs actually were really bad from a crime point of view. And what we saw was a, 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 effectively a very sort of uh, suburban form of design being brought into uh, cities, and it wasn't, it, it wasn't working. Uh, we already had a Hume that didn't work. Uh, it's become rapidly depopulated, um, now that actually we weren't able to house families in large amounts of accommodation, so we, we knew we had to do something different. And we started thinking about what does uh, in this sense, livability uh, mean. And certainly the notion of uh, defensible space came in and, and getting rid of incidental open space. Open space had to have a purpose and that purpose had to be well defined. Part good, uh, a, an empty croft that had been left lying around, not, uh, uh, not so good. Uh, we thought about the street uh, and thought actually for, for the way the people want to live their lives, the street's really important. But uh, what is a street? It, as well as living on it, it ought to go somewhere. Uh, that we, we start to think about proportions. So if the buildings are this height, what width uh, should the street be to make it uh, livable? But what can you see down, uh, down the street? A, a street that goes somewhere gives you uh, uh, passive surveillance because people go. it makes it a lot safer place to be. We started asking ourselves all these sorts of uh, questions that ultimately ended up in what was really our first design guide, which was the Guide to Development in, in Hume. The Hume Arch, we could have built a cheaper bridge than the Hume Arch, but uh, that was about uh, a message about Hume, which had effectively been this cut-off island, even, even given that's location from the rest of the city. It was about reconnecting Hume uh, with, with the rest of the city. So we started to learn about uh, uh, symbols uh, with, within that. Talk about some things we got wrong. Going back to Stretford Road, we didn't plant any street trees first time round. We had to go back and retrofit that. So there were, mm. uh, there were, you know, we had to keep rethinking this. You know, uh, you the, well, well, I, 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 absolutely. But I, I have to say that for regeneration in this city, and the uh, regeneration professionals that have led a, a, a lot of it, Hume and the Hume City Challenge was the most fundamental experience mm. that we ever had and has really been uh, the basis of everything we've done ever since. The IRA bomb was obviously a milestone moment happening right at the beginning. And I wonder whether over the 24 years there have been other, what you might call pivot points that have changed the direction of the city or changed the thinking of the city about development. Over time, there have been a number. Compared to estate action programmes, one was down in uh, uh, Bench Hill, which then was one of the poorest areas uh, in, in, the, in the city. And we had an estate action programme there, which basically uh, double glazed homes, provided cent uh, central heating, but didn't really do uh, any, anything else. Uh, we did not fundamentally change that area in any way, shape, shape or form. Alex Park Estate, on the other hand, in Moss Side, where again, this was almost entirely physical works. But what we did is we 
uh, closed all the uh, alleys that connected things off. We opened up rows to get rid of cul-de-sacs. Uh, we did what I've just been describing for, uh, for Hume. And within a matter of years, something that had been a, 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 a low to no demand estate uh, was full to the extent uh, that the Member of Parliament for uh, the area, the Manchester Central at the time, Tony Lloyd, uh, contacted me because residents were uh, complaining that they uh, couldn't get homes on Alex Park Estate. And I would say to Tony, well, let's face it, Tony, that's a lot better than what they used to complain about. They used to complain that they couldn't get off Alex Park uh, <laughs> Estate. But, but that's actually uh, relatively simple design changes that had a fundamental difference in the, in the, in the way a place, uh, place worked. Another example of something that's changed the relationship with places is that until probably the first part of, well, th this century, new primary schools uh, were nearly always single storey, uh, sprawling uh, buildings with no shape, no presence, uh, nothing mm -hmm. to them whatsoever. Uh, you'll find from probably around about Haverley Hay Primary School, Medlock on, that every new primary school in the city has been at least uh, a two-storey uh, building. Uh, they are easier to manage, uh, educationally easier to manage. Uh, they take less land, which uh, given that actually of late we've been struggling to find sites for schools, that uh, maintaining our land is really, really uh, in, important. They're generally environmentally more uh, sustain, sustainable and we did start putting features in like we can measure how much water you've been recycled and uh, how much uh, effectively smart metering so that pupils could see, uh, see that at, uh, at, at, at the time. Uh, so again, functionally inside the building they worked a lot, lot better. But for a lot of our neighbourhoods, the local school is the most significant building uh, in the neighbourhood and you know we've got all of those magnificent Victorian Edwardian schools, lots of them uh, left. They say something about the area. What we wanted was to have our primary schools to say something about the area. Mm. So even if you didn't have kids in the school, you, this said this area's got some value because that's been built in, uh, built in our neighbourhood. Uh, how we use de design and how we use regeneration to deliver messages as well as things is really important. So that was all of the North East Manchester development and right over to say the Manchester Communication Academy where we did some workshops the other day. Uh, well uh, that, that, that's a, 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 a different program that's the uh, the building schools for the future program where we did rebuild uh, or bring up to as new standard every single high school in the city and at that time uh, we were allowed uh, by the rules to uh, uh, design each, each we, yes we standardised some stuff, we standardised quite a lot of stuff, but it, each school that was designed for the area it was going, going in, each school, the users, the staff and the pupils were involved in design workshops about what they wanted uh, within, and the same was true for primary schools uh, as well, going back to that uh, co-design ele element of, uh, of this. Um, we were able to, I think, produce some really fantastic buildings through doing that. I have to say, I think it's probably in the period of the uh, coalition government that uh, uh, they've taken an approach to funding new school buildings now, is that basically uh, if they could have sheds, they would have, uh, they would have sheds. They've really dumbed down on the qu quality of the, the environment, and I think that's a real shame. And I say, because it's... There are two things to this. The building does have to work functionally inside. It has no point whatsoever unless it works. It's got to be a really high quality educational environment. But it's also got to say something outside as well. And uh, I've talked about the Etihad campus. Just go along the road from there to the East Manchester Academy. Uh, a mixed use building because it's got public library in there as well. We did lots of uh, multi-use buildings at the time uh, as, as well to extend the use of the buildings. And it's in an area, I think, that needed it, you've got a really striking building there. You mean it's not all because you're a city fan? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no, we, we have uh, done stuff in other parts of this, uh, the city besides East Manchester. Of course, when we were doing it, actually when we were doing this, it was, uh, uh, well, the, the, the sports city is that uh, uh, Manchester City were not even our first choice of user for that, uh, <laughs> that complex, believe it or not.
when people come up to you in the street, what do they think you as leader of the council can actually do? What do they think you can deliver? What can you actually deliver? Well, it's what does local government do? What do uh, uh, leaders do? And I, I think there are probably, besides that councils deliver services, and some of those are pretty important uh, services, and clearly most of our money is spent on services to the most vulnerable people within our society. Adult social care, children's social care is what we spend most of our money on, and that, that's fairly, fairly important. And what you do over and above that, uh, then I think you do uh, uh, two things. First of all, we are a custo custodian of place. Um, Manchester City Council exists for one reason only, and that, that is this place, Manchester. We have no other reason for being uh, whatsoever. So we have that role as custodian uh, of, of place. Uh, the second, I'll describe it in this way, is that we are the convener of place. Uh, because of our role as the custodian of place, we have the authority to bring people together. Uh, other public sector places, the universities, uh, the private sector, uh, the voluntary community social enterprise sector, citizens groups, we, we have the authority to bring that together. And by and large, it's that convening power that allows us to bring about the sort of substantial changes that we have been able to uh, make. I suppose a good example of this kind of partnership building and building with, and working with other people is, you know, the, the corridor, you know, design, science, innovation story of, of the corridor from the Whitworth, Manchester Science Park, University of Manchester, MMU, now of course with Manchester School of Art, also Manchester School of Architecture, M Manchester Fashion Institute, the new School of Digital Arts, Circle Square, right up to here to the Central Library, that whole corridor development. And now, just off that, between here and the new public park in Mayfield, the old Umist building, which was kind of the seat of innovation in the past, I suppose you might say, is the heart of the new ID Manchester. So I, I wonder how important that story of design and innovation is for the future of Greater Manchester. Well, I think the corridor is very important. Our universities are, are, are very important. Uh, I have to say that in terms of the quality of new, uh, new buildings, that. Uh, uh, Manchester Metropolitan University has done somewhat better than, uh, than the University of, uh, of, of Manchester. Uh, but uh, again, you know, there, there is some really good quality stuff uh, there. Probably the most significant change around that, though, was uh, uh, the reason we are able to look at developing uh, ID Manchester is because UMIST merged with the old Victoria University of Manchester to form the University of, uh, of Manchester. So the most significant part of that story was that merger taking place. And certainly, if you go back before 2004, uh, John Gartside and Martin Harris were the two vice chancellors of the universities then. Uh, so I had a view, um, other people had a view, that it would be really good for Manchester if we had a world-class university. And although they were both very good universities, uh, not only were they not what I described, certainly as world-class research universities, neither of them on their own had the capacity to be uh, scale, to be uh, world-class research universities. And the, the merger that took place has created the, the scale that allows us to create that uh, world-class university. It's allowed the rationalisation of the, of the site, and again, for an increasingly land-hungry city, that's really, really important. And that's what's created the opportunity for uh, ID uh, at Manchester. The government has been trying to be more place-based in its approach over the last few years and trying to understand how to do that. So how important is it to have that kind of innovation uh, cluster, shall we say, here in order to attract funding and to develop things from here? I think, uh, I've, look, you've got, you've got the two universities and they're two very large universities, they're two very good universities, they're two very popular uh, universities and uh, they bring skilled workers uh, uh, in, into the city. Um, they clearly do a, a lot of transitional research within them. Uh, they're important economically in their own right. They're both mega employers uh, w within the city, but within that complex you've also got uh, I think the biggest hospital complex in the country uh, uh, there as well. You've got a really successful science park uh, there. Uh, the amount of culture on the corridor, uh, starting with the you know, Whitworth at one end, Contact Theatre, uh, up to Home and Central Library at uh, this end, which is 
popular music, you've got the Academy, you've got Deaf, in Deaf Institute, you've got Yes, you've got Gorilla, uh, you've got Dance. And that, so so the, there is a lot going on uh, there. One of the, uh, we've clearly improved some of the uh, public realm very significantly uh, uh, down there. I think what we're beginning to do, and only just beginning to do, is to turn it into a far more mixed-use neighbourhood, which is to have more people living uh, within the area as well. And Circle Square is an example of that, I think well-designed example of that, that as well as some student accommodation there, that there is already general purpose living accommodation uh, going to that area as, as well. And I think that we will develop that uh, rather more, I think, over, over a period of time. Because although the, the area is important, it will work a lot, lot better um, if it becomes slightly more mixed use than, is, than has been. Well, the other element of innovation is that you haven't stopped at redesigning the city. You've also uh, put your hand into redesigning local government and coming up with uh, models for devolution. You played a big part in the deal that uh, actually set up Greater Manchester Combined Authority. And that deal is different from any of the other devolution deals in that you have a devolved health budget, a devolved skills budget, which gives opportunities for innovation in those areas. Yeah, I've, part of this is, is to do with um, uh, history as well as, uh, as ideas. And for 12 years, I was on the uh, executive of, the, of Eurocities, which is the uh, uh, organization of large cities in, in Europe. We're still a member, even though we're not in the European Union. Uh, anymore, they haven't thrown us out. Uh, so on the executive, two years I was vice president, two years president, and then two years uh, past uh, president. Um, there used to be lots and lots of discussions ar around uh, European cities about the notion of metropolitan uh, governance, and uh, Italy had a form of metropolitan uh, uh, go governance, uh, France did, uh, lots of other places wanted a form of metropolitan governance. The only place where there was any form of metropolitan governance, at least from uh, around about 2000 in this country, was, uh, was, uh, was London, which I always thought was a fundamentally flawed model because it was a two-tier model with no real connection between the GLA and the 32 uh, boroughs in, in, in London. Uh, the French metros consisted uh, in a defined... Uh, geographical area of all the communes within that, uh, within that area. The political geography very different to here, so Lille Metro, would uh, you've got Lille, by far the biggest component there, going down to communes that might only have uh, 100 people uh, living in them, but every commune was part of uh, the, the, the Metropolitan Authority there, the metro region. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of system we really need for Greater Manchester, it's something where there isn't a division between your metropolitan level and your locality uh, level. It is something that gives you the metropolitan level, which but is a single tier structure. Mm -hmm. And that's where the combined, or the notion of the combined authority uh, uh, came, came from, because the combined authority uh, was uh, conceived as being something that will be wholly owned by the 10 districts within Greater Manchester. And the Combine Authority was, it was invented here. It was designed for uh, great, Greater Manchester. Uh, it, we got it into legislation before the 2010 uh, general election, but for our Combine Authority to get it approved, it was, the order was laid before, um, approved afterwards, which is also a lesson about cooperative working, because at that point, uh, Greater Manchester had five Labour control authorities, three Liberal Democrat, two Conservative. When the government changed, all ten local authorities wanted the change. Mm. So as the government changed, uh, you know, the Labour authorities have been lobbying the Labour government before. The Liberal Democrats and Tories lobbied the government after, which is how we got it, uh, uh, got it through. The coalition government, uh, particularly following the City Growth Commission and other things like that, were quite in favour, for economic reasons, of city devolution. It seems that the present government is uh, may, maybe not exactly on the same page, and I was just wondering, is it a ratchet, this devolution, that will result in a good, effective model of not having a very centralised government in this country, and, and probably or is it on shaky ground? But the combined authority model, I think, is pretty uh, uh, solid at the moment. I wouldn't say it will never change, because these things 
uh, do change over time. But to bear in mind, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority was de designed by Greater Manchester for Greater Manchester. You should not assume that you just adopt the same model and it will work for, uh, work for you. This city region has always been very important, not only to the residents of the city, but to everybody in the whole region, and not only in the current city region, but also beyond. And a lot of the other urban centres, they've faced lots of challenges about dying high streets and all these different things. And I'm just wondering, how do you see the future of connected urban centres and how that works with, in, in a metropolitan area? First of all, if you went back 25 years ago, uh, quite a lot of what's now Greater Manchester didn't feel particularly connected to the city. That's something that has uh, changed. Uh, Commonwealth Games had a major effect in that change, by the way. That, that gave a lot of people in Greater Manchester a feeling of ownership that they didn't have uh, previously. But there's also a, a generational issue uh, there. After a, a few years ago, the, uh, uh, the Oldham riots, that uh, survey work that was done of people in uh, Oldham found that uh, older people didn't particularly identify with uh, Manchester. Younger people almost entirely saw themselves as living in, in part of uh, part of Manchester. So this is something that uh, uh, has changed o o over time. I think for the future of town centres, what the relationship with the city is, I, th I think there is some quite strong research evidence that points us in the uh, right direction. Uh, first of all, there isn't a successful region anywhere in Europe that doesn't have a successful city at the, uh, uh, the heart of it. Uh, secondly, uh, the biggest single indicator of the success of a town is the proximity to its nearest city. And by proximity, I don't mean just literally distance. It is uh, its connectivity, its ability to, uh, uh, to travel there. Uh, four or five years ago, the Inclusion Unit at the University of Manchester did some work to look at inclusivity in uh, uh, Greater Manchester, uh, ranked places on uh, their level of inclusivity, uh, the place that came out as the most inclusive uh, was actually Trafford, also the most affluent uh, uh, area. But there are other things that uh, uh, were distinctive about uh, uh, Trafford. Not only was it most affluent, it had the highest rate of commuters uh, and it also had the highest rate of business uh, startups. All these things are related. If you look at what's happened around London, uh, going back pre-COVID over the last 20 years, and look at rates of growth, uh, the most successful places were not the centre of London itself, it was towns around, the small cities around, that effectively fed off London. This is not trickle down, by the way, this is feeding, uh, feeding off. Uh, those commuters uh, would take money back into their areas. Uh, if they were starting businesses, they would often start businesses in those, uh, those areas. We are starting to see that, uh, and, well actually we're more than starting to see it, we are seeing it in, in, in Greater Manchester. That, I think, uh, really I think instructs us about uh, what we really need to do to revive uh, a lot of our town centres. Uh, we need to improve transport links, which clearly uh, through bus re-regulation and other investment we are attempting uh, uh, to do. Uh, that they certainly have to have a residential element within those uh, town, town centres. But you have to bear in mind that in Manchester city centre, uh, that effectively there needed to be an element of gap funding to support residential development for at least 15, 16 years mm -hmm. before we came to where housing development became marginally self-sustainable. Well, I know a lot of people don't believe that when they see the, the tower blocks going up and, and so on. But the economics of this is that they've only just become better than uh, marginally sustainable. And it does mean for a housing office, uh, uh, offer in places like Rochdale and Oldham uh, that we have to have some very patient capital. And that probably means public sector investment, not grants, but public sector investment to allow that 12, 13, 14 uh, years. So improve transport, create a, a housing offer, uh, I guess the other big thing is to improve quality of education and training because uh, skills is absolutely uh, fundamental uh, 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 to this. Probably the last thing I would say, what, what is one thing that Manchester has done over non-stop and is still doing 
over the last 25 years that no other city in this country has done is that we have invested year in, year out in culture. We've invested in the arts. Um, it's not all we've invested in, but that's a really, really big part of why uh, people want to live in the city because of that investment in arts and culture. Well, and the new factory uh, cultural arts centre is also reconnecting the city with the river as well. Well, abs absolutely, and there's going to be, uh, uh, was down there this morning uh, in what will be the, uh, uh, the, one of the bars for the, the formal auditorium part of yeah. that, which is looking down on what is going to be some lovely public realm uh, yeah. taking you down to the river. In the city, there are now a number of what you might call districts that uh, represent different things, like that's in St John's, which is uh, culture, and you've got uh, the Museum of Science and Industry, you've got the old Granada Studios, um, you've got the Knowledge Quarter with the Corridor that we were talking about, you've got the Innovation at ID Manchester, you've got Enterprise and Fintech in Spinning Fields, you've got the Creative Industries in Northern Quarter, uh, you, then you've got places like Chinatown and the Curry Mile and Gay Village and so forth. And some of these districts that we have, have have been kind of, shall we say, developers' ideas or master planned ideas. Others have just appeared. And I wonder what is the city's role in, in that and in knowing when to get out of the way? A lot of what you've talked about is the, the city centre. And uh, we've been working within planning uh, uh, frameworks. You know, there, there is a lot of planning that goes uh, in, in, into this. and. Uh, work on what we will have and what we won't have. Uh, that's something else we've done in, in terms of development is we're very clear about what is acceptable and what isn't uh, acceptable. We do have the most demanding residential property guidelines in the country, for, uh, for example, because we want that uh, uh, quality product. We also want to uh, maintain a distinctiveness within the city centre. So. Uh, what, what do we want? We, if somebody comes to Manchester, we want to know they're in Manchester. Uh, but if they're in Castlefield, uh, we don't want them to think they're in Ancoats. Uh, we don't want them to think they're in the Northern Quarter. We want these different parts of the city to have their own distinctive uh, character. And I think so far we've succeeded in uh, uh, doing that, although clearly some of these neighbours like Spinningfield just come out, uh, there was nothing like that uh, 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 pr previously, so they've developed a, a character of their own, uh, if, if you like. But I think there is a danger of seeing this journey just within the context of the, uh, uh, of the city centre, uh, and the, the, the design question just in the context of the city centre. So, uh, you were talking about economic clusters. That if you, if you go down to uh, uh, the Brooklyn's Bagley part of Withenshaw, there's a whole diagnostics industry down uh, down there. Uh, we are currently we I, I, I use we a lot. I'm, I've got virtually nothing to do with this. Uh, that we're going to probably be building one of the top five uh, oncology research units in in the world in the Paston Institute down in uh, Withington at the, at the moment, sticking with a the health theme. Uh, our biggest single regeneration uh, project is the uh, health campus at North Manchester General Hospital. And again, um, uh, MFT and uh, Manchester, Greater Manchester Mental Health Trust have been absolutely phenomenal partners leading this, uh, this process. But this is not simply just rebuilding uh, a, couple of, a couple of hospitals. It's looking creatively about, well, what else should we be doing uh, with this? As well as acute care, uh, we ought to have primary and community care on this site. Uh, we employ a lot of people here, uh, thousands. We ought to have uh, training uh, on this site, particularly training that relates to the work that's going on. Not least they all have uh, labour shortages uh, in, in there. Um, the traditional model is uh, if you've got spare land, you sell it off to a developed, uh, developer to build housing. So now we, we want some housing that relates to the health campus, so uh, key worker housing, extra care housing that relate, re, uh, relates to that. So these, these are lessons that are not just about the city centre, these are lessons we are applying uh, in, in other parts of the city, in other parts of the city that uh, are in many respects far de more demanding than working in the city centres. Mm. I know the city is full of people who claim paternity of the Northern Quarter, but I understand what the role that the City Council played 
in, 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 in doing it. And it is interesting to see how things do evolve organically when you create the space for them, I suppose. So, well, it's also, again, no, the, uh, a lot of what we talked about is the physical nature of, uh, of, of cities. It's, we have to remind ourselves occasionally uh, is that cities aren't, uh, aren't buildings and the spaces in between. Cities are people. Uh, that uh, actually without people you haven't got anything at, at all. And uh, we, we do now see within the uh, city centre communities uh, in a way that we didn't have 30, uh, 30 years ago because nobody lived here. Uh, nobody lived in the, in the heart of the city and we see some communities that are more mature than others. So I would take, for example, Castlefield over a period of time has become a mature community. Mm -hmm. You also see changing patterns of behaviour. Uh, 25 years ago, city centres were places that uh, m predominantly young people would come and live in for a couple of years and then they'd shoot off to the uh, uh, suburbs to do whatever it is that people do in the suburbs. And, uh, <laughs> Why people would, it's utterly beyond me, but that's what people do apparently. But what we see now is the, uh, the length of people living in the city centre gets longer and longer and longer. So for a lot of city centre residents now, the biggest issue is their tenure and how long their tenancy is, uh, is mm. for, because they don't want to move at the, uh, uh, at the end of it. We see the, average, the, age, the age range of people living in the city centre getting wider, an increasing number of people who retire to the, uh, the city centre. Uh, the idea that we have 50,000 super rich people living in the middle of Manchester is not quite true. We might have some, but mainly, this, mainly the city centre is young workers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you've said that uh, the driver of politics in Manchester since the early 90s has been jobs, jobs, jobs. Is that still the case? No, the biggest priority was and is uh, tackling uh, deprivation. Climate change, zero carbon, is got to be a fundamental priority for uh, anywhere. Our awareness as we've become an ever more diverse city. I've heard it claimed that we are the most linguistically diverse city in, uh, in Europe. I think this, ch this number changes all the time, but uh, we have something like 190 different languages spoken in our primary. Uh, primary schools, 190, yeah. Uh, we are a pretty diverse place. Uh, within all of that, uh, the whole question of equalities is, uh, and actually tackling inequalities has become very, very uh, much more fundamental. But going back to something you asked really, really early on uh, in, in this, when we're uh, talking about li uh, livability, uh, I think we've begun to recognise that probably the biggest single driver uh, of economic growth, but probably a lot of other things we, we need to do is quality of place. Quality of place is now alongside jobs, zero carbon, equalities as being probably, the, they're, the, they're the things that need to drive what we do going forward. And John Kerry last week was talking about Glasgow and he was uh, drawing a line between Glasgow's industrial heritage and playing a role now in ending global warming. I'd say, you'd say you could say the same thing about Manchester in spades. I mean, it's, it, it's industrial revolution story in its role now. And we talk about a, a budget, a climate change budget. Do you think Manchester is able to really deliver on that with retrofitting and all those types of things? I'll tell you a side story first, which does relate to our uh, uh, historical past. And I, I suspect some people have seen, seen this, but I, I did a visit with the Director General and the Regional Director of the National Trust to the Castlefield Viaduct. Uh, uh, last week and took a picture and put it out on uh, social uh, media. And one of the comments from somebody on that was, uh, why don't you just leave it to grow wild? <laughs> uh, now, if you go down there, bearing in mind it's been wild for probably uh, 40 years, virtually nothing has grown on it. Mm. And the reason nothing has grown on it is because it's, it's so contaminated. So actually, if we want to make that useful, we're going to have to clean that. Uh, uh, sorry, the National Trusts are going to clean, uh, uh, clean that land, which they're going to do. Yeah. Well, but that, we have that heritage all, all over the uh, place. So it's not just the air, it's what's beneath our, our feet as well, that a lot of that needs to be uh, cleaned up. Can we do that? Well, yes, I think uh, uh, we can do that. Can we do that as a city on our own? No, we can't. 
there are some things that, for example, uh, decarbonizing uh, our electricity uh, supply that has to be done on a, a far bigger, uh, bigger, bigger scale. Uh, that certainly we can probably deal with about 75% of uh, uh, our carbon emissions within the city. There's a big chunk uh, uh, are outside. But in order to deal with that is that we have to have pretty much 100% engagement of everybody uh, who lives, works, has businesses in, in the city. And although the Climate Change Partnership is, is absolutely doing great stuff, probably the engagement at the moment is around about 25%. Mm. So there is a real challenge for us collectively about how we engage um, uh, everybody else. If you look at what we've done, uh, the City Council, working with Salford City Council and Transport for Greater Manchester around the city centre transport strategy. Although we expect the number of jobs to grow very significantly, we expect the number of people living and number of people working in the city centre to grow very significantly. Uh, we expect the proportion of people travelling to the city centre uh, well, not actually, not just the, what the proportion, but the absolute number, uh, doing that by sustainable means to, to grow and the number of people using the private car to diminish. And that, that has happened over the, uh, uh, well, the, the past 20 years. We, we have seen uh, a modal shift with, within that. So um, it doesn't mean we need to make our public transport more sustainable than it is at the moment to, uh, as well. But uh, I, I think getting... Good public transport, uh, green public transport is going to be absolutely crucial within this process. But at the same time, we have been uh, slowly been making the city centre more pedestrian uh, uh, friendly. We have been closing roads off. We have been creating pedestrian uh, uh, spaces. Uh, we have said um, that by 2028, we expect all new build to be uh, zero carbon. Uh, and that has really t taken uh, a lot of the uh, development industry in the city and the construction industry to start working collaboratively about how they can ensure that it does become uh, zero carbon. We've got some uh, houses out in East Manchester that were constructed by or on behalf of uh, uh, One Manchester uh, where they managed to be z uh, zero carbon both in terms of operational carbon and embedded uh, carbon at something like 10-15% above standard uh, prices, social housing, mm. uh, that, that means that's a 10-15% gap that we have to uh, uh, el eliminate. That, that sounds doable to me over, over a period of time and by just simply saying this is what we expect by 2028 uh, then and that's what the industry is starting to develop. They're also looking at ways there is an Australian system that I can't remember the name of about how we can effectively measure the sustainability of, uh, of buildings as well. And we will see in the commercial sector over probably in the next six months a number of planning applications from different developers uh, coming forward that really start to meet those levels of, uh, of sustainability. So uh, regulation is the quickest way of bringing about change. Uh, it is the case, though, that city councils have relatively limited regulatory powers. Mm -hmm. National governments have a hell of a lot of regulatory uh, powers. Uh, they could use them far more effectively, I think. All beta cities really need a compelling, distinctive story uh, on the international stage. And I know Manchester has a really strong character. We like, to, we like to say always, well, we do things differently. I think a lot of cities probably say that, but Manchester certainly likes to say that. We have science, design, sport, music, literature. We like to think of ourselves as a radical city. We point to the co-op and, and free trade and in the Industrial Revolution. We also talk about the original modern city. I was just wondering, what is, what is your story for Manchester? Talking about the original modern, modern city is by and large understanding the purpose of original modern uh, within the context. And post-Commonwealth Games and uh, Clearly, around sport, there was a very clear long-term strategy uh, that to continue to use sport, to continue to use uh, events. But what happened in the Commonwealth Games started to make us think uh, far more carefully about what the brand of Manchester uh, was. And we moved very rapidly 
from what the brand of Manchester was, because the answer to that was fairly clear, the brand was Manchester. Uh, it's what does that brand mean? Yeah. Uh, what, what's the nature of that brand? What are the characteristics that distinguish Manchester from, uh, from other places? And spent quite a lot of time, um, and by quite a lot of time, it's well over a year, really researching the character of, uh, of Manchester and came out with, I, I think, some quite distinctive uh, features around uh, the, the city. Um, that We were an open city. And if you go back to the Industrial Re Revolution, one of the reasons uh, that uh, we became the preeminent industrial city was, was our willingness to uh, welcome people from wherever uh, who came here to do stuff. Uh, that, so we were an open, uh, open city. Um, we were a very much a live and let live uh, uh, city. And you mentioned uh, the gay village uh, earlier. Why did a gay village develop in Manchester when it... it uh, other places tried to manufacture them, and you're right, it developed organically. There were, there were stuff the City Council did, by the way, um, and I think I'll, I'll t say, take uh, uh, two, two things. First of all, we liberalised the licensing laws in uh, uh, Manchester that allowed more independent places to uh, flourish. And the second thing was is that we started to create uh, uh, effectively pavement uh, uh, cafes, and a lot of this was led by uh, uh, private entrepreneurs. And I'd, I'd put down the, what became, if you like, the uh, current gay village was uh, uh, a place called Manto on, on, on Canal Street. Uh, they put tables and chairs on the pavement and the police tried to close them down and councillors went and sat on those chairs and, uh, and, and tables then and made it rather more difficult for them, for them to uh, close it down. So. Uh, we did kind of uh, uh, act on that. But, so the live and let live is a very deep-rooted part of, uh, of the city. Uh, there's also um, uh, probably one of the most significant things is uh, what's often confused for mank arrogance, but we, we do have uh, attitude. We, we started to understand uh, the elements of the character of, of, of the city. And original modern was came up with as two words to describe those character, uh, characteristics, not to be uh, a brand slogan in, or a strap line in any way, shape, or form. Original modern was two words to understand what the character of the city uh, is, and that's the way it should be used rather than describing it as an original modern city. It should be used to judge what we do. The law and regulations mandate a lot of things to do with inclusive design when it comes to uh, people who can't see very well or can't hear very well and so forth. But there's also generally designing for an aging population and for children and for basically for all different users. What is What can cities do to lead the way? Over the last 25 years, Manchester's population, average age has got two years younger. Uh, England has got four years older, which I think, so we have become younger. However, we were one of the first 10 cities in the world uh, to, to be recognised by the UN as an age-friendly city. So we started doing this uh, through the Joint Health Unit, uh, probably around about 2002, 2003 is when we started uh, that journey to be age-friendly. Uh, there are a number of aspects of, uh, of that. And uh, first of all, it is to stop seeing uh, older people, he says, as an older person, as being a, li uh, a liability, it's to stop seeing them in deficit terms, to stop seeing them in pathological terms, <laughs> and start seeing them in what contribution they make to the life of the, uh, of, of the city. Absolutely fundamental uh, within this. Uh, there are things that uh, you can then start doing. Uh, very, uh, our first extra, extra care scheme, extra care accommodation for older people, it's largely ordinary accommodation that if at some point they require additional levels of care, they don't have to move, they can get it within where, uh, where they live. Uh, and what I think, uh, Withenshaw 135 was the first scheme. We've, I think, built seven or eight more around the city uh, uh, since then. Uh, first of all, it improves the quality of life for older people who move into it, no end. Uh, larger because it has, uh, uh, as well as high quality accommodation, it tends to have a social aspect that goes with it as well. 
uh, an awful lot of people have chosen to downsize into that accommodation, freeing up family accommodation very, that we're desperately short of in, 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 in those uh, areas. Just an, an example that by, by and large, by creating that sort of accommodation, it helps make the city more uh, age friendly. We are hoping uh, over the next couple of years on city council owned land somewhere in the city centre uh, to bring forward actually uh, uh, an older per person's living scheme actually within the city centre uh, as well which will again this is not going to be some form of sheltered uh, accommodation this will be a private development mm -hmm. scheme but particularly targeting uh, older people because Lots of older people like going to gigs and like going to bars and like going to restaurants uh, uh, as, as well. So yeah, let's let, let's make it easier for them to uh, uh, to do so. So do you think that to be an age-friendly city, we should also maybe look at making them uh, child-friendly? Again, the thing that frustrated me for years is that we didn't have a single children's playground anywhere in the city centre. Now we've got one in Piccadilly Gardens. Um, Piccadilly Gardens, which the Evening News hates, actually. People seem to love it because it's it, nobody ever used to use it until its current iteration. Now it's nearly always full, and that playground is really uh, heavily heavily used. So yes, we should be a child-friendly uh, uh, city, and again, making sure that we, we have uh, facilities, support, uh, high-quality schools, out-of-school uh, activities, and so on is is part of uh, of, of doing that. And I think. Uh, uh, given the dominance of COVID on all of our lives at the moment, uh, and I think particularly the impact on young people is probably greater than on any, any other segment within uh, our, our society, is why we've chosen for Manchester to make next year uh, our year of, the, uh, year of the child. So a really symbolic way of expressing that we want uh, this, this city to be a good place for, uh, uh, for our, our young people. But you know, the, the the, the language of what, uh, what we do, it, is, it does go from uh, uh, a great start in life to uh, uh, a great getting old within the city as well. Yeah, Manchester has long had close connections with China, uh, particularly with Wuhan, uh, a sister city for such a long time. And, and of course you've attracted a great deal of Chinese investment at the airport and the Northern Gateway. And uh, now, and, and a lot of that was also developed in partnership with the government. Uh, uh, earlier on in the, in the last decade. And sometimes things shift, and I wonder how you navigate that as a, as a city with these long-term projects. Well, polit politics shifts, uh, international politics uh, shifts, that's un un undoubtedly uh, uh, the, the case. On, I guess, some of the issues that are raised about other places in, in the world, you have to ask the question, uh, who would you trade with? And, uh, on a lot of criteria, you wouldn't even trade with this country, never mind uh, uh, <laughs> any, anywhere else. So you do have some limited choices here. I think the judgments we tend to make and um, uh, ha have made quite regularly is starts off from uh, what impact does this have on Manchester and on Manchester people? Uh, what's the benefit to uh, uh, Manchester people? Um, the people who we work with uh, the developers, w when we work with, when they are working in this city, do they do they uh, uh, respect and reflect our values as a city? Do they work with those values uh, as a city? Because frankly, uh, we only want to work with people in Manchester who, when, certainly when they're working in Manchester, uh, reflect our values. The the owners of Manchester City Football Club came in and made promises when they, they bought the football club. Uh, they promised to Im uh, improve the football team. Well, they, they seem to have uh, done that uh, reasonably well. Uh, they promised that they would uh, not only continue, and um, Manchester City already had a really good uh, community involvement tradition. Uh, they promised to build on that, and they have, uh, they have done that. And they promised to contribute to regeneration, and in particular regeneration in East Manchester. And I don't think we could have really anticipated to just the scale with which they have made that contribution to regeneration in, uh, in, in East Manchester. By far the biggest example of that is the establishment of the uh, uh, City Football Group headquarters and their training facility uh, directly opposite the, uh, uh, the, the stadium. And yeah, it's a really good example, but uh, it doesn't matter uh, really 
for any company coming into the city, and we want people to come into the city, but we want them to recognise what we stand for as a city and to reflect those values. Do you think that in Manchester we could fruitfully uh, up the dial a bit on uh, design innovation? And what I mean by that is, uh, I'm, I'm particularly thinking about maybe promoting product design in relation to graphene instead of allowing you know, patents to be developed in all other parts of the world when it's actually come from here. And also, sometimes we talk about digital without thinking about the design that you need in order to make digital effective and work for people and work for applications, work in health, innovation, all those areas. Yeah, it's uh, this distinction between digital as a, a tool and digital as a, a direct activity. I think that's uh, absolutely right. If we just take uh, uh, graphene, which is now, I think, increasingly become a a shorthand for a whole range of two-dimensional materials. There are, I, I, I have been told how many two-dimensional materials we now have that have been discovered in Manchester, but it's, it's uh, 30, 40. It's, it, it might even be more than, uh, uh, more than that. And lots of work about how you can put these different two-dimensional materials together to create a, a new, another uh, new material. And, uh, I, I think the reason... Uh, we persuaded or uh, gave government the opportunity to uh, develop the National Graphene Institute was to do the blue sky research in the city. Uh, the reason we uh, again got uh, support for the GEEK, the Graphene Engineering and Innovation Centre, was to start bringing that blue sky thinking together with uh, industry to turn it into uh, products. And certainly, if you look at the industrial strategy for the city and for Greater Manchester, the final part of that uh, is to, well, as that turns into products, to try and make sure as, that as many of those products as possible are being developed and are being built and being constructed in Manchester uh, as well. We won't be able to do all of them, uh, but, but that is the aim to uh, increase the extent to which we're able to do that. So to move away from things being invented in this country being built somewhere else, uh, to have more of it b b uh, built here. So, so artists and designers, young creatives, um, you know, they have, really have an important part to play always in, in placemaking. But the problem is that once places get successful, they're kind of priced out of the market, they can't be there anymore now. And I know that you've been involved with Rogue Artist Studios, and I'm wondering <coughs> whether that is something that can you know, all be done on a larger scale in the city? Well, I think we've got a number of examples of things that uh, we have done, and we do need to do uh, more, because I think we're probably going to lose some uh, rehearsal space in East Manchester within the next three, three or four years, so we, need to, we have a shortage of rehearsal space, so we, we'll need to do something about that. Uh, I'm actually in, intensely proud of uh, what we've done with... Uh, uh, rogue, uh, rogue artists' uh, galleries in studios in uh, Va uh, Varna Street, and they were in Crus Crusader Mill. Yeah. We're about to be made homeless. So we, uh, I think, actually, Sarah Alderkin's in the uh, audience yeah, as well, yeah. who did a lot of the search to try and find the alternative premises. And we had a, uh, a three story primary school uh, in East Manchester. It was never going to be used as a primary school. We built a new one for what was in there. It's a listed building. Uh, we needed a use for it and we offered it to uh, 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 Rogue as it, for when they moved out of Crusader Mill. Always the question, would, uh, uh, would artist studios work uh, out in Openshaw, on the Openshaw Gorton uh, border? I think every studio was taken almost uh, immediately. Uh, company Chameleon, which is now, I suppose, the city's resident dance company, moved into the old nursery building uh, there. We have Architecture for Children in there as well, another project uh, uh, in there. Within the last few weeks, we've eventually agreed a long-term lease for them. Still at Peppercorn. Uh, you know, th th this is, th it's a great example. This is artist studios that we've provided, but it saves us money because we know, uh, but by giving them a long-term uh, lease, they will be able to go out uh, and get investment in order to be able to improve the building and, and do all the things that are required uh, uh, for it. I, I guess it, there are other areas which, uh, whilst it, they are different, but they've created affordable space for young creatives. Uh, and uh, the, the notion of uh, uh, the flexible term, in-out sort of space, uh, which 
has been commercialised to a certain extent, but you know, uh, the Sharp Project out in uh, East Manchester, 2008 we did, uh, did that as a city council, it's still going. Quite a lot, a lot of companies uh, at one point left to go and try the WeWork experience and very rapidly all wanted to go back to Newton Heath and the Sharp Project. Space Studios, we, you know, we ha uh, as well as the studios itself, we've created workspace so that companies that support TV and film are able to have bases there uh, as well. So, so we've done a, a certain chunk of this. Uh, certainly, I think over the next uh, decade, uh, we are going to have to find some more ways than creative ways. We, we have one or two old buildings. Uh, we're still looking at how we can turn Crossy House uh, into a potential uh, art space as well. So we've got some of those. But when we can do those win-wins, that's absolutely brilliant. We need a few more of them. Actually, we need quite a lot more of them. So in just a few weeks' time, you're actually stepping down. It's uh, coming at you like a train, I imagine. Um, so Manchester, is it... Uh, the job done, is it, or is it a work in progress? <laughs> cities are. I, I, I occasionally like to describe cities as an organism, because uh, uh, and they're, they're either uh, well, they're either growing or dying. C cities are always a work in uh, uh, progress. So, for somebody who occupies a sort of uh, role that I've, I've occupied for twenty-five years, uh, the idea that after twenty-five years you get to something—it's a nice, neat parcel, and you just. Uh, walk, it, no, it doesn't work like that. Uh, I've realised for a long, long time uh, that most of the stuff I'm doing won't be finished and it will always be about handing it over and somebody else will take, uh, take that on. I also uh, recognise that uh, uh, although I, I think we will have uh, in many ways a level of continu continuity, that stability I think has been an important part of how we've been able to uh, uh, develop. Uh, different people do things differently. So it will, be, it will be different. And really, I'm looking forward to seeing how it's going to be uh, uh, di different. It's not something that frightens me or worries me and, and, and so on. This is just what happens. Bev Craig, who will be taking over my role, I'm absolutely confident that you know, Bev will do a superb job, but she'll do it differently to the way I've done it. And uh, yeah, I think that's great. It's right. Yes. Uh, who the hell would want another me? Uh, come on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Indeed.